Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome back to Robotics Today, uh, this ongoing experiment on uh, virtual uh, seminars in robotics. Uh, today, we welcome Scott uh, Kindersman, who is coming from Boston Dynamics uh, to talk about uh, humanoids, and as well as Sangbe Kim, who is our uh, invited guest panelist, uh, specialist, uh, waiting to, to ask those uh, spicy questions. Um, <clears throat> Scott has spent most of his uh, adult career uh, working with dynamic machines and um, uh, bashing machines and pushing on them just to uh, take joy to see how they struggle to stay balanced. <laughs> uh, all the way from when he was at UMass working with UPOD, then as a postdoc being the lead um, of the controls team at the MIT DARPA Robotics Challenge. And, uh, and then um, later now more recently, uh, he moved to Harvard, to Harvard where he uh, also did uh, research on humanoid robotics and more recently um, as most of you might know, transition a transition that uh, I'm sure was equal parts exciting and, uh, and complicated uh, to be a research scientist at Boston Dynamics, where he, he leads a team of engineers that, um, how to put it, they, I guess they have fun uh, getting Atlas to do crazy things. And um, Scott, we're all eager to, to hear more and see more of uh, what's, what's up with Atlas. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much, Alberto. Uh, so let me get the screen share going. How's that look? Great. All right. So yeah, thanks very much. I'm uh, excited to have the opportunity to talk to all of you today and share some of the uh, work that we're doing on the Atlas project at Boston Dynamics. Uh, be but before diving into that, I wanted to give just a, a few slides about all the things that are going on at the company and, and who we are as a company um, uh, more broadly. So Boston Dynamics is a, a company that's been around for quite a while, uh, over 25 years. And, and throughout that time, its uh, activities have evolved quite a bit. Uh, but one thing has sort of remained constant, and it's this uh, overarching long-term goal of trying to create robot technology that uh, meets or exceeds uh, the performance of um, uh, humans and other animals. And this is an, along many dimensions, right? So uh, building uh, robots that have, uh, you know, mastery of their own body dynamics uh, that, that allows them to uh, fluidly and robustly and efficiently move through their environments as well as uh, abilities to make intelligent decisions and perceive their environments in ways that enable them to uh, uh, do manipulation um, and, and affect their environments in useful ways. So obviously this is a really big goal um, and we're not close to satisfying it yet, um, but we're all sort of motivated and excited to try to play uh, a part in bringing this, uh, this technology to reality. So uh, over the past few years in the company, it's been a particularly exciting time um, because there's been a concerted focus on uh, turning a lot of the robotics to technology that's been developed in the company over the years into sort of bona fide robot products uh, that people can buy and that would uh, ideally add value to um, you know, their own projects and businesses. And so what that's me meant is that We've had to sort of find ways to balance our sort of core mission of uh, identifying and solving hard robotics problems that uh, you know make significant jumps in the state of the art, uh, along with you know doing all the things that are necessary to, to really develop and uh, deploy products, you know, you know robustness testing, certifications, and uh, support infrastructures, and all that stuff. So uh, that's been that's meant that we sort of had to grow pretty rapidly. So now we're up to about 290 employees. Uh, along with that increasing headcount, we have an increasing real estate footprint as well. Uh, so we're, we're about to move into a new headquarters, uh, still stationed in Waltham, Massachusetts. Um, but you know it's going to be a much larger facility, uh, all shiny and brand new, and with lots of great uh, facilities for doing cool, cool robot development. Uh, we also have another office, which is uh, all the way on the other side of the country in Mountain View, California. Um, and so they're also, you know, just moved into a new facility and growing rapidly. And that's sort of the, the heart of a lot of the work that's happening on the sort of logistics side of the business. Uh, in terms of a, a robot lineup, uh, if you will, 
so I'm sure you guys have all seen uh, uh, most of these robots before in, in, in various uh, media outlets or, or, and or YouTube. Uh, so Spot is sort of our general purpose, uh, uh, super famous uh, quadruped robot um, that's meant to you know, do lots of things and, and do them well. Uh, we have some technologies that are being a little bit more focused and trying to address certain uh, problems um, in logistics that we think would be a high value for robots to solve. And then Atlas is our you know, pure R&D effort uh, that doesn't have an immediate product horizon, but is a sort of vehicle for us to uh, explore innovation in hardware and software and try to solve problems uh, that we think will be really important for our company uh, you know, years into the future. So um, just a couple of slides on the robots that aren't Atlas. So you know, Spot, as I said, is our kind of go anywhere, do anything robot. And you know, not being part of this project myself, but being able to be inside the company and observing how this has, you know, made the transition from what was originally a research robot to, you know, a product that is in people's hands all over the world has just been super cool and, and a really unique opportunity. Um, you know, and uh, part of, part of the thing that's exciting here is that this is a technology that didn't really exist, right? So there wasn't really, you know, uh, quadruped robots that could kind of uh, go in, into challenging environments and actually do useful work and do useful inspection. And so part of the the, uh, the fun has been identifying what the markets actually are for a, a technology like this. And so it's been cool to be able to see Spot uh, in people's hands doing things as varied as kind of going underground and inspecting, you know, mines and power plants to doing, uh, you know, remote uh, um, interviews and things like that for, uh, for med medical applications and in particular in response to the recent COVID epidemic uh, to, you know, dancing with um, Cirque du Soleil performers, right? Uh, and, you know, what a time to be alive. Uh, if you didn't catch the news last week, uh, we just launched an e-commerce e e site. So if you have a credit card that's burning a hole in your pocket, you can literally go on a website and order yourself uh, your very own spot, which is uh, pretty cool. Uh, so on the logistics side uh, of uh, our product efforts, we've uh, got a couple projects that are uh, ongoing. So Handle, which you've all seen uh, in various incarnations on YouTube, is, is really our sort of, uh, obviously, a mobile robot that's meant to go to where the work needs to be done um, and is geared towards doing things like palletizing, depalletizing, packing and unpacking trucks and trailers. And so it has to solve lots of really hard problems about, you know, being able to accurately and, uh, and quickly perceive um, objects in, you know, very, very lighting situations, as well as, uh, with uh, sort of heterogeneity in the uh, in the items that it needs to deal with, um, and you know, be able to move dynamically, quickly, and also in highly constrained environments like the backs of uh, trailer trucks or shipping containers, things like that. Uh, Pick is uh, sort of uh, the robot you see on the right is is really a, a product that's a a three D vision solution that is aimed at uh, quickly and reliably um, uh, palletizing and depalletizing with mixed skew uh, uh, pallets. Um, and it's something that sort of can be integrated with, with off-the-shelf arms. So that's a, just a very quick summary of all the other things that are going on in the company. Uh, so for the rest of the talk, I'm just going to focus mostly on what we're doing, uh, in particular on the Atlas project. Um, and so, as I said, Atlas is really our, you know, R&D system. It's, it's the thing that we're using to ask really big and hard questions and, and see how much progress we can make and, and how quickly we can do it. Um, so, you know, the a large part of what makes atlas special is uh you know what's built into the hardware and i'm not going to talk a lot about that um but i want to give at least one slide that, that kind of gives you a summary of some of the key technologies that have been innovated within the company over the past several years that make atlas the really special robot that it is and so you know this robot we call it atlas but it's really you know maybe depending on how you count it like the fourth uh, incarnation of humanoid uh robot at boston dynamics those of you have probably seen the the, uh, the previous versions that were used as part of the DRC. This is a very, very different uh, robot, uh, despite sharing the same name. Uh, so some of the key technologies are, you know, really high power, high density batteries, um, you know, hydraulic power units that capture all of the important pieces of a hydraulic uh, control um, uh, power system in a very small form factor that can fit, you know, inside the volume of roughly of a human torso. Um, Custom valve technologies uh, that a lot, that support really high um, uh, uh, bandwidth and high efficiency control uh, using techniques like structure optimization and leveraging modern metal 3D printing to 
build uh, uh, components for the robot that are both uh, really strong and very lightweight. And all these things sort of feed together into producing a robot that is both high strength and low weight, which is really the, the ingredients that you need to do sort of exciting uh, athletic behavior. So um, as a sort of overarching mission uh, for what we're trying to do on Atlas is broadly, we're trying to create breakthroughs in dynamic whole body control so that we can eventually say we're at a point where we're meeting or exceeding uh, you know, typical human performance. Now, obviously that's a tall order and it's, and it's a long-term goal, but we feel like we're able to make steady progress towards that goal. And it's something we think that is attainable. Um, so this is a concept animation that gives you a little bit of an idea of the kind of things we're targeting. And uh, it's interesting because it contains a lot of elements of things that you're not typically used to seeing a humanoid robot doing, right? So moving very quickly, running, you know, jumping, coordinating its whole body, doing out of axis rotation, touching the world with things that aren't its feet for the purposes of mobility, right? So there's lots of stuff going on here that's a little bit like outside of the typical humanoid box. Um, and so this is really the kind of thing that we're after and what we're doing. And as an organizing activity, as a project, we've been uh, focused a lot on parkour uh, over the past couple of years. Um, and so you might reasonably ask why, why parkour? And um, so parkour is interesting in that it has a few features uh, to it that um, raise interesting technical questions, I would say. Um, so the first is that it's, it's characterized by you know, high energy athletic behaviors that would presumably put us up against the physical limits of the robot. And that's a good place to be for us because it forces hardware innovation, first of all, and second of all, it forces uh, software innovation because we have to be able to have control techniques that can capture the relevant uh, constraints of the robot in order to um, behave robustly and, and, and feasibly. Um, it's explicitly responsive to the environment. So parkour is about sort of looking at what's going on around the robot and then choosing dynamic behaviors in response to what it's seeing. Okay, it's not. It's very different than the activity of you know, maybe building a very reliable walking controller and having it walk blind through a field or something like that, right? Um, so this forces us to be able to uh, not only have perception that's able to extract meaningful information quickly um, using sensors on the robot, but, you know, do something with that information to change the, the dynamic behavior so that the robot actually uh, succeeds in what it wants to do. Uh, and the third thing is that it's sort of characterized by variety. So this isn't a utilitarian uh, get from point A to point B uh, method of locomotion. It's, you know, explicitly superfluous in that it, it, you know, it's doing spin jumps and flips and all these kind of crazy things along the way. Um, and so that really puts an emphasis on us being able to uh, rapidly create a variety of behaviors that are in this sort of very athletic and dynamic space. Okay, so that puts a kind of constraint on the tools that we have to uh, create in order to, to fulfill this goal. So I'm going to start in terms of videos with a uh, uh, one that we've already released. I'm guessing most of you have already seen uh, this video before. Uh, so this is uh, Atlas doing a um, sort of floor routine that combines a bunch of different behaviors that, you know, um, include rotations around different body axes, you know, touching the ground uh, with different parts of the robot's body, fluidly moving from one thing to the next. Um, what it doesn't quite include yet is, is one of the pieces to the puzzle, which I pointed out is perception. Uh, so the robot's kind of, you know, just executing these behaviors in a big open space. So it really just has to care about where the floor is. Um, uh, but this was a great starting point for us in, in exercising the tools that we've been developing over the past couple of years and showing a, a you know, a peek at the sort of variety and dynamicism that we're, we're um, trying to create. Okay, so um, I wanna start with a couple sort of guiding principles that we've been uh, uh, using in order to make sort of technical choices about how we're approaching developing parkour controllers for Atlas. Uh, the first is, as I mentioned, this idea of doing rapid behavior creation. And this is something like being able to go from a concept of a behavior, uh, like a, you know, say a 360 jump, to your first set of robot tests in the same day, right? So that's kind of where we wanted to get to. Um, 
What this is not saying is something like uh, being able to have, you know, uh, any person off the street come in and author, uh, you know, a fancy parkour move for Atlas. It's okay if the person doing this still needs an engineering degree, um, but what it shouldn't be is something like having to write a completely bespoke controller every time you want to do something new for the robot. Um, the second piece of the puzzle is uh, now that we're sort of talking about behaviors as discrete things, uh, ideally we'd like each one of these behaviors to be as extensible as possible, meaning that it's reasonably robust in the face of the types of perturbations we'd expect the robot to experience. And it's also uh, adaptable to uh, whatever is going on in the robot's local environment. So for example, if I was able to easily create a behavior that it amounts to the robot jumping on top of a box, but I had to create a new quote unquote behavior for every possible relative transformation between the robot and the box, uh, at some point this becomes less and less useful. So really we'd like to uh, be able to create a large number of different behaviors, but sort of within each kind of behavior class, we wanna have as few elements as possible. And so that, that puts an emphasis on having really good online control. So, um, this is basically the architecture that we've been developing in order to do this. Um, and it's basically broken up into two parts. Uh, first is an offline phase. And this is really where you might use the term behavior creation. And we're leveraging offline nonlinear trajectory optimization in order to create uh, sort of template behaviors uh, for the robot. And these you know, can range in, you know, in, in, um, in variety with the kind of things that you're seeing here. So, you know, jumping on and off ramps and doing spin jumps and flips and, and so on. Um, but then these form a sort of database of behaviors that are available to the robot online. And so it's really the job of the online planning control system to uh, look at the environment around the robot, uh, use information that's available uh, through the perception system to select from among the behaviors in its library. And then it has to use online model predictive control in order to adapt those behaviors to successfully execute them given the current situation that the robot's in. Um, and so this sort of decomposition between offline and online we found is a really nice balance because on the one hand, the offline computation makes what we're doing online sort of able to be fast and feasible, um, but it also gives us a sort of nice way to iterate over behavior designs uh, uh, without having to run robot experiments. So I wanna talk a little bit about how we're um, going about formulating and solving these optimization problems. Um, so there's a bunch of different ways where you could reasonably think about formulating a trajectory optimization problem for a robot like Atlas. And the, the particular choice that we've made is to um, decompose the, the problem into two parts. One where we're solving for the momentum dynamics of the robot, sometimes also called the centroidal dynamics. Uh, and then we subsequently solve for a whole body kinematic trajectory that is consistent with the centroidal solution and also takes into account various other uh, maybe task specific uh, kinematic constraints. So this is an idea that lots of people, you know, particularly in the last five or so years have, have gained a lot of traction with. And, uh, you know, we're no exception at the group that forms the Atlas team. You know, many of us are uh, from the same places in academia previously, and we have uh, experience using exactly these types of models. Um, so, uh, and, and there's some papers down at the bottom here that, you know, are, are good examples of people having success with models like this. Um, but this is just a particular choice. And we make this choice for, you know, basically, you know, computational expediency. This, this tends to be a nice middle ground between model complexity and, uh, and uh, computational efficiency. So it can sort of represent a lot of the behaviors we care about while not being uh, so numerically um, troublesome that it becomes hard to use. Uh, so one thing that we're doing uh, in this decomposition is we're sort of mirroring the structure both offline and online. So we're solving similar problems offline and online, but the details of how those problems are set up and solved differs. Uh, so what happens offline is that we're typically solving longer horizon, more densely sampled problems, um, whose costs and constraint structures end up being quite task specific in general. Uh, and these are computed things basically from scratch. So if I wanted to 
optimize a front flip behavior. I'm, you know, adding in specialized constraints for, you know, starting at point A on a ramp on a box and landing at point B on the floor and maybe accumulating two pi rotation and pitch uh, over a flight phase and things like that. And it's the job of the trajectory optimization to produce a sort of high quality template motion in the form of a full state trajectory that is going to help online optimization subsequently when the robot executes it. Um, so on offline, we have long horizon, dense, big nonlinear problems that aren't fast to solve. Online, um, we have you know, a very task generic uh, problem structure where much, we're thinking about much shorter horizons, uh, much more sparsely sampled uh, problems for obvious computational reasons. And, uh, and they're gonna be largely driven by the, the behaviors that the robot has in its library. So the cost structure is gonna be very uh, tied to um, sort of trying to stay close to these motions while also adapting as necessary to what's actually happening with the robot. So I'll talk just uh, very quickly about uh, uh, what, it, what does it mean to solve these two optimization problems. And, uh, and I'll do it without math because I actually think the math doesn't add a, a ton of value in explaining these ideas. Um, so first of all, with momentum optimization, what we're really talking about is solving some kind of an optimization problem that's going to tell us how hard, where, and in what direction we need to push on the ground or other surfaces in the environment. Um, and we uh, want to figure out how those forces, you know, integrate over time to affect the center of mass and the orientation of the robot. Um, where, you know, now we're talking about a centroidal model, so we're talking about center of mass locations and thinking about the robot as, uh, you know, a so-called single potato, where, you know, the inertia of the robot can be represented as a single rigid body like an ellipsoid, as you're seeing in these pictures. Um, one of the sort of details that was interesting about the, the types of problems that we're solving that involve things like backflips is that the, um, uh, the ability to change the inertial distribution of the robot during a behavior can actually be pretty important. So for example, if I want to optimize a front flip, um, you know, if I knew you know, in the optimization that I could shrink my inertia in flight, and that means I, you know, ultimately need a lower angular momentum at liftoff in order to achieve the same rotation through the flight phase. Uh, and that could be pretty useful if something like a front flip is riding the limits of your actual robot. Um, so we've played a lot with different formulations that, you know, have the flexibility to represent these kind of changes. Um, and I wouldn't say that there's any particular set of choices that seems to be the magic, uh, um, uh, the magic combination to make this work really well. But what does really help is having a flexible implementation that allows you to sort of turn on and off these features in the form of constraints and, and, and uh, you know, variables in the optimization problem uh, so that you can sort of only uh, add the complexity that's relevant for any given behavior. So the output of this is again going to be a sort of centroidal trajectory uh, that you know, is basically center of mass motion and, and maybe ellipsoid orientation over time. And we have to sort of turn that into some reference motion for the entire rest of the robot. Um, and as I mentioned, that ends up being another optimization problem. And so here's uh, an example where um, we have a centroidal solution up at the top where you can see this sort of uh, ellipsoid starts uh, standing on a box, which is invisible, unfortunately, in this animation. Um, and it's rotating you know, 360 degrees around its uh, pitch axis and shrinking its inertia in flight. And then on the bottom, you can see another input to the optimization, which is a pretty lame initial guess at what a backflip should be, right? It's basically slurping the pelvis uh, you know, two pi around the pitch axis. And, uh, and we take these as inputs and put it into an optimization um, that is trying to, again, solve for generalized configurations and velocities uh, that are consistent with the momentum trajectory that we computed in the previous step, plus any other sort of geometric constraints and so on that might be relevant for the problem that you're trying to solve. So these could be things like, if I wanted to jump up onto a box, uh, it's pretty important that my feet don't travel through the box along the way, right? So you might wanna have constraints that say, make the feet go around the edge of the box with some clearance so that when you run on the robot, it doesn't sub its toes. Um, so uh, this is a, a really just an amazing uh, 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 tool for us, you know, being able to sort of realize, uh, you know, really um, graceful motions using uh, pretty uh, uh, sparse inputs has uh, been a super uh, useful tool. 
All right, so uh, I wanted to show you some examples of what you can do with sort of what I've described already, uh, along with the MPC controller, which I haven't uh, uh, explicitly talked about yet. Uh, but these are on the top trajectories that were optimized offline. And then these are executions of these trajectories on the robot through our MPC controller. Um, and the key here is that the robot's executing them in sort of conditions that roughly match what was uh, um, used to compute the offline solution, right? So we optimize a box jump on our 50 centimeter box. We run it on the robot with a 50 centimeter platform. Works just fine, that's great. Um, and likewise, you can do other things. So here's some examples of jumping down off of a box and uh, in this case, using hand contacts in order to brace as part of the landing. It's a sort of an early exploration for us into uh, using hand contacts as part of the uh, uh, behavior library and actually being able to uh, track those forces on the robot. Uh, here's an example of just using a single foot kind of touchdown jump off of a ramp. Um, here's another example of just a bigger box jump. So you know, we were working on box jumps one day and thought, well, how high can the robot go? So we went to the gym and found this uh, 76 centimeter platform um, and uh, threw it in the lab and got the robot to jump on it. Uh, interestingly, this is maybe one of the a uh, few times where the robot accidentally excites a resonance with an object in its environment and then manages to damp it out. So that was a nice little happy accident. Um, uh, and it's also important to acknowledge that not everything uh, works beautifully the first try. So uh, here's an example of uh, an attempt at trying to do a backflip. So, you know, spent all the time, optimize a back trajectory, ran it through a simulator, looks beautiful, run it on the robot. Uh, reality happens, right? So here's the toes slipping on the top of the platform, you know, running into some actuator limits. And that means the robot doesn't take off with the requisite angular momentum. So it doesn't get all the way around to land on its feet. And, and that's what happens. Uh, here's a, a similar example. Um, this was, you know, actually it looks kind of dark in the lab. So this was late on a, a Friday. Uh, Robin Dietz and I had, had a great week, we were, we were crack, cracking through a bunch of behaviors and we thought we'd try something really daring, which was a standing front flip uh, on flat ground. And uh, we, we managed to go and gather a couple people who were still in the office and we're like, oh, check this out, this is totally gonna work first try. And, uh, and then we made it about halfway. Um, and subsequent attempts didn't go much better than this. Uh, so there's sort of two points here, you know, if nothing else, the robotics is kind of an exercise in resetting expectations. As soon as things start going really well, you, you get uh, overly confident and then reality comes crashing back down. Uh, and the second thing is, I think this is just a great example of the kinds of things we're able to do with this robot that are super enabling, right? So uh, the robot after this stood right back up and we were able to run something right after. And that happens way more than you would expect. So this is just an incredibly reliable robot. And even when we do break it, we have the sort of luxury of having a top flight um, support team who can swoop in and uh, disassemble robots and reassemble them in working order in, in unbelievable amounts of time. And this, I can't overstate how important this really is for uh, uh, making progress as quickly as, as uh, we feel like we do. Okay, so I've kind of talked about uh, just the trajectory optimization piece and how uh, you can use the outputs of that uh, to do, you know, behaviors in isolation on the robot, but that's not really what we're set out to do, right? What we really want to do is, as, as I said, look at the environment, be able to see what's going on, and then draw upon a library of behaviors, adapt them as necessary so that we can uh, do something that looks like parkour. Um, so we need some extra pieces in order to, to do that, so I'll talk about those next. So the first thing is uh, we need some way to be able to see the world. Um, and uh, there's lots and lots of uh, potential complexity in, in this problem. And what we've done is, is leverage the fact that, you know, parkour can be reasonably defined with lots of structure in the environment. And so we're leveraging the structure that we have in order to make this problem uh, as simple as possible and so we can make progress. Uh, so here we're basically using uh, depth cameras and algorithms for plane fitting in order to identify uh, local planar regions in the robot's environment, and then using those to plan contact events in the future, which become inputs to our uh, MPC controller. Um, 
speaking of MPC, uh, the, you know, as I said before, we're mirroring the same problem structure as the offline optimization, but making sort of various technical decisions uh, for computational expediency. Uh, so we still have the nonlinear momentum dynamics of a robot. There's no escaping that. Um, and so our approach as a sort of online controller is to iteratively linearize these dynamics and solve a convex QP at every time step. Um, and in order to do that efficiently, we're exploiting you know, problem structure. So when you write down a problem like this, you basically have two approaches to be efficient. One is make the problem as small as possible and then you know, have a dense problem that's tiny. Uh, or you can make the problem bigger and sparse and then use smart linear algebra operations to take advantage of that sparsity. Uh, we chose to do the latter. Um, and what this controller is really doing is uh, computing contact wrenches over time. It's uh, adjusting contact locations in the world uh, based on what's happening with the robot. And it's all, also able to adjust the timing of the behavior itself. Um, and that's really, really important. Uh, so if you just think about something as simple as jumping up and down on the ground, uh, it's entirely plausible that when you run this on the robot that it won't take off from the ground with exactly the right momentum that, that matches what you had in your offline plan. And if you're just naively tracking that offline plan, uh, it's, things are gonna start to be troublesome right around the touchdown event after that jump because um, you're not going to adjust for uh, when you're actually going to hit the ground and where you're actually gonna hit the ground. And so being able to sort of always be recomputing that solution on the fly and then uh, optimizing touchdown configurations for the whole robot that are consistent with that solution is a, is a really important key here. Um, and things just wouldn't work if you were uh, more just naively tracking uh, uh, trajectories. So this is a, just an illustration that's like a little bit similar to what was on the previous slide, but it, I think it gives you a little bit of insight of you know, how this is all working. So this is from an actual robot log uh, being played back at one quarter speed. And so you see a few different things going on here. Uh, first, the robot's actual estimated state is this gray version of the robot here. This red robot is sort of our uh, predicted touchdown configuration that the robot's actively trying to get to. Um, you can see these uh, blue arrows coming out of the robot are its planned center of mass trajectory into the future, where the magnitude of the arrow corresponds to the uh, planned momentum of the robot. You can see the contact forces that it's planning to use both now and into the future uh, in order to achieve uh, that center of mass motion. All right, uh, I want to show a couple of videos that give you an idea about what robustness MPC affords you over uh, just naive sort of trajectory tracking. And so this is independent of the perception uh, part of the system. This is us sort of perturbing the robot blind while it's trying to execute a jump trajectory. So um, in this case, the robot's sort of trying to jump into the air and do this sort of sidekick pose. And some mean engineers off to the side yanking on the robot really hard with uh, around 100 pounds of pulling force. And so what you see is the robot sort of quickly throwing its body back and, and uh, catching itself. Uh, there we have another version of a video like this that uh, I'll show that gives you a, maybe a little bit better idea of what's happening under the hood. Uh, so here you can see the robots again, jumping straight up and down, this time not doing a fancy pose. Um, but on the bottom right, you can see what is happening, you know, sort of in the robot's head, if you will. Uh, so initially there's a plan to sort of jump straight up and down. And you'll see that conveyed uh, through these little red and blue coordinate frames. Uh, hopefully they're visible, what you guys are seeing. Um, and so you can see the robot sort of planning to jump straight up and down. And then as soon as its estimate realizes it's being yanked, it's now deciding to deviate from this plan and go all the way back here, throw its feet down and apply forces once it gets to the ground, coordinate linear and angular momentum in order to eventually come to rest above its feet again. Um, so this is the kind of thing that, you know, I, I think would be hard to get if you're more naively sort of doing time-based tracking of, of trajectories like this. Okay, so uh, we've talked about perception we, uh, a little bit. We've talked about you know doing this online predictive control. Uh, we have to think a little bit about the sort of connection between those two in order for the story to kind of make sense. Um, 
And so, you know, if we imagine we have a relatively sparse library of trajectories that do things like jump on top of boxes, um, you know, it's generally going to be the case that uh, the boxes and the location of the robot relative to boxes in the robot's actual experience are going to differ from the specifics of whatever the template motions uh, uh, contain, unless you're very careful about curating your robot environment and, and, and trajectory library, which we're, we're, we're trying not to do. Um, so really what we want from perception is to give us new sort of target locations relative to the geometries that are actually in the robot's environment. And then that becomes an input to the model predictive controller in addition to whatever template motion we select. And so the job of the MPC is really to do the heavy lifting to figure out, okay, I need to sort of stay close to this nominal motion, but also I really need to sort of hit the ground here. And it has to do all that computation on the fly in order to you know, translate and yaw the robot, jump higher or jump less far, et cetera, um, uh, in order to do what the perception system is asking it to do. So here's an example where you can see Robin going in and uh, moving boxes underneath Atlas. So this is an example where you have some, something on the order of four um, trajectories that the robot can select from. And it's really using the, the fact that it can uh, retarget those trajectories and using online optimization in order to fill in the details to make the robot actually go where we want it to go. Um, so there's sort of another piece to this puzzle. Uh, what you saw in that video was a robot sort of sequentially executing a bunch of jump behaviors, one after the other, stopping in between, which is cool. It shows an element of adaptability because we can take trajectories and make them do things that are slightly different than what they uh, would represent nominally. Um, but again, it doesn't quite tick the box of parkour for us, right? Uh, really what we're after are things that are sort of fluid motion from one behavior to the other without stopping. So um, we thought a little bit about ways that we can do that. And, and this is the sort of solution that we're taking so far. Uh, we're going to assume that the robot always has available to it a queue of behaviors that are sort of drawn from the trajectory library. How this queue is populated, we have different answers for. So in the case of the floor routine video I showed at the front of the talk, uh, a person just decided this is the sequence of moves you're gonna do uh, and so go. Um, but more generally, this could be a job for a planner that is using information for perception and maybe other sources of goals in order to intelligently select which behaviors to try. Um, and then again, we're gonna allow MPC to do some heavy lifting here uh, by allowing it to sort of splice up these trajectories in different ways, as well as having the horizon of the MPC controller itself go across the boundary from one behavior to another in order to make smooth motion happen. And so here's an example of a video of a robot that's jumping, uh, doing two one meter jumps one after another, uh, where the, uh, there's nice blending that's happening uh, uh, in the middle, where normally the robot would have jumped stopped and then started a, a subsequent jump behavior. Now it's sort of able to smoothly execute these two things in a row. So to see what that gets us on the real robot. So here's a, on the left is the video I, I showed you in the previous uh, slides where the robot's sort of executing one jump after another and uh, slowly making it straight through the course. And here we're seeing uh, you know, a very similar uh, jump library where it just has a bunch of box jumps, but now the MPC control is able to um, uh, splice these things together and blend it in a way that creates really fluid and fast motion. So this is starting to get a little bit closer to what we think of when we do parkour. Unfortunately, uh, if I were to put you in this space and say, you know, please traverse these boxes, um, I doubt very much that you would kind of bunny hop around like we're showing in this video, right? So this is clearly a, uh, you know, not a very natural or beautiful or efficient way to get uh, over obstacles like this. Um, so it leads to a, a question of, you know, how could we improve this situation by uh, simply, you know, adding to the robot's behavior repertoire? Um, and it naturally leads to the question of whether we can do sort of single-footed motions, which is probably what you would do over that terrain. Uh, can we do that using the same sort of framework that we've been building to do these more sort of whole-body episodic motions? Um, and we're finding that the answer is yes. So you can imagine solving these offline problems where we uh, compute a centroidal solution that has certain symmetry and periodicity properties. So here's an example on the left where uh, you can see the center of mass motion 
of the robot, as well as the planned contact forces that goes from left foot to right foot over a single stride. Um, and then we can take these and we can solve co corresponding kinematic problems that uh, you know, match this sensorial solution while also having other nice uh, you know, po postural properties that we you know, would find uh, appealing for running. Um, and then we can sort of just mirror these things and concatenate them together to create extended sequences of jogging. Um, and so you can do this and then it turns out you can put this on the robot and you can again see sort of what that gets you. And so now on the left we have the example from the previous slides where we're doing blending with two-footed jumping and then going over more or less the same boxes but using now our augmented library that has mirrored single leg trajectories. And so you can see that it's, it's really an interesting uh, uh, system that we have here that we're able to kind of add to a library and drastically improve the capabilities of the robot in some cases. Um, but I think we're really just starting to scratch the surface on, on, uh, on, on what we think we can do with, with tools like this. All right, uh, so this is uh, just one more video that I'll show that's kind of uh, very recent work that we've been doing in the lab um, where, uh, you know, the robots, you know, continuing to do this sort of single leg motions and, uh, you know, starting to look at different types of obstacles. What I like about this uh, video is that it gives you a perspective from the robot's point of view. So what you're seeing is what the robot is, quote unquote, seeing. Uh, and additionally, we have sort of overlays from the output of the online footstep planning system, as well as the uh, model predictive controller. So you'll see um, sort of the decision-making of the robot happening in real time as it traverses a course like this. You can see these blue vectors, which again, correspond to the center mass trajectory into the future. Um, you can see the uh, planned uh, footsteps at, at leading out in front of the robot. And these are gonna be you know, planned again with respect to the geometries identified by the perception system. And then you can see on those footsteps, the forces of the robot intends to impart in the environment in order to get its body uh, from point A to point B. Um, and I think like one of the things for me when looking at this, it really just reflects how fast all of this stuff is happening. So it really, I think the constraints on, on wall clock time for you know, doing sophisticated computation like you need to do in order to uh, you know, uh, connect the sort of discrete level of planning of footsteps to continuous behavior, uh, there's really just strong requirements on making that as fast as possible. All right, um, so I wanted to leave off with, with sort of uh, you know, maybe a look back and, and a little bit of an assessment of where we think we are in terms of our broad goals on the project. So again, I, you know, I think we're really just starting to build the foundation um, for what we eventually want this robot or the next generation of this robot to become. And that is sort of meant that we focus a lot on kind of development of core agility and focusing a lot on control problems and estimation problems and so on in order to show that we can, you know, in principle create performance limiting, very exciting athletic behaviors. But eventually, uh, as this technology matures, we're, we're basically creating a, the next generation of problems for ourselves when we have to think about uh, perception and autonomy systems that allow us to really leverage the capabilities of the robot, um, as well as uh, uh, making the robot a, a sort of um, bastion of interaction, uh, meaning that it can both sort of affect its environment in, in useful and interesting and exciting ways, as well as uh, uh, people who are able to use this robot as a, as a, for example, a very advanced tool to do work in environments. So for us, I think we're, we're thinking, you know, several years into the future that the growth areas for uh, Atlas and, and probably for the company more generally are more focused on these notions of perception and autonomy, uh, planning and machine learning and, and interaction. Uh, that's all I've got for slides. So I'm happy to uh, chat with all of you and try to answer your questions now. Thank you very much, uh, Scott, for this very exciting and entertaining talk. Uh, on top of all of the controller details, I loved hearing about how you integrate perception now as well. We can't wait to get started with the panel discussion. And we have many questions ourselves and also submitted by the audience. Uh, right. So just, just a few logistics. Um, below the live stream on the webpage, you can submit questions or you can upvote existing questions and we will pick up these questions during the panel discussion. 
Uh, and part of the panel today are Dong Hyun Kim, Krishna Chunivasan, Rachel Holiday, Neil Doshi, Nima Faseli, and the usual suspects, Alberto Rodriguez, Marco Pavono, and myself, Jeanette Bulk. And we also have a great guest panelist today, Stang Bae Kim. Uh, professor Sang Bae Kim is the director of the Biomimetic Robotics Laboratory and a professor of mechanical engineering at MIT. His research focuses on bio-inspired robot design by extracting principles from animals. And the work I know best from Sang Bae is the MIT, MIT Cheetah. This robot is capable of stable outdoor running up to 13 miles per hour and autonomous jumping over an obstacle at an efficiency of animals. So with that, I would like to invite Sang Bei to ask his first question to Scott. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much for, for Scott for great talks. And as usual, is just impressive, impressive work. Um, I have a like endless list of questions. I can probably spend like an hour by myself, but uh, trying to prioritize for, uh, for the audience. So I'll start with the more like uh, like a cliche question maybe, but it's, I think it's a, a high uh, priority in the list. Um, you show a lot of uh, uh, different uh, model-based control uh, learn. And what I will start seeing, especially mostly from a uh, graphics community, uh, we start seeing mixture of machine learning and data-driven parts that like doesn't really work with the model-based approach. I like to ask question, uh, would you willing to replace some of your work uh, or your team's work with the machine learning? If, if, if yes, which part? If, if it's not, why? Can I ask that question first? Yeah, uh, great. So, you know, uh, I would say broadly as a team, we're super open-minded about the algorithmic choices that we make in order to solve the problems we're interested in solving. Um, and so, you know, we're particularly interested in a lot of the results that's happening in the reinforcement learning literature over the past several years, particularly for uh, you know, robots that are doing things that are in the sort of behavior space of the, the sort of things that I've showed you today. Um, and we've spent some time working on that ourselves as well, you know, you know, building up some ability to do reinforcement learning in our group and uh, developing simulation results that um, um, were you know, pretty compelling. So uh, I think it's, it's less a, a question about replacing things that we're doing as what, and, and more one of adding value to what we're doing. So, you know, what we're doing is, is making certain simplifications to make the system work, right? So the model uh, granularity that I discussed doesn't capture everything that's important for a robot like Atlas, right? So there's really important details and actuation dynamics that really matter that come up when you run these things on the robot and uh, details about um, weird corner cases for state estimation and delays and all these things that, you know, the community knows are, are very important details. Um, and these are places where data-driven approaches can potentially add some value. And so what we've been doing is kind of picking, you know, picking our problems and trying to find out ways that we can make the most progress as quickly as possible. But we expect that at some point we're going to run into some walls, right? There's going to be some limitations of our approach that are more or less fundamental. And we're excited about exploring opportunities where, you know, data-driven techniques could be a piece of the, a piece of the puzzle to, to making uh, you know, system go from, you know, 90% to 100% uh, um, uh, performance. Great, thank you very much. Um, uh, I have another question. It might be a little bit uh, complex, I guess. The, it's about complexity of the uh, structure of the controller. You know, we learn from school, like uh, A, B, C, small component tool and mathematics and, and theories, but eventually in order to make this kind of work, uh, robot work, and uh, not even like reality, like even just research to make a behavior achieved, you need to struck uh, your, you, you have to do like architect your control algorithm really well. You show already like the two levels of abstraction of model, but you know, how would you divide this abstraction of level and what, uh, you know, bandwidth computation time is required to represent that abstraction and there, what kind of tool you have to use. There, there's a lot of complexity. Uh, eventually, it's like one design problem, and uh, we have a hard time even teaching like a mechanical design uh, uh, as, a, as a teaching tool. Mm -hmm. How, as a person who's been a professor, uh, how would you teach this uh, uh, to student or, or, or for, for the community? Because a bunch of uh, most of people here are, are trying to learn, uh, because it's not something you can learn from school easily. And uh, if I add one more question, is how would you deal with the generality versus versatility? 
I think the Hosunamis might be the like the probably the far frontier on this, like yep. doing multiple different things with the common tool. I guess it's these two questions are kind of related. So if you can yep. touch on how to teach. And yeah, so I think on the teaching front, um, there's no re re replacement for actually doing it, right? So uh, I think insofar as we can create uh, courses or educational experiences that um, expose students to the realities of getting a complex system to do what you want, um, you know, the, the better, because the, the, it's hard to sort of do a blackboard uh, discussion of, you know, how to debug a, you know, joint controller or, or how, to, how to, you know, do things like that. So I, I think, um, you know, there's no, there's no replacement for uh, getting your hands dirty and, and working on these problems for real. And so for students, that means, uh, I think, uh, trying to take as many project-based classes as you can or uh, trying to get involved in research labs if you have the opportunity to do that you, your university. I think uh, many of us who've, uh, you know, had careers in, in robotics started out that way where we, you know, just were helping out trying to, you know, make progress on other people's projects in robotics labs and then eventually grew into um, defining our own. Uh, let's see. So in terms of, you know, the trade-off between um, um, complexity and, and sort of like versatility, uh, you know, it, it's it sort of um, depends on the, the scope of what you're trying to do. So if we're trying to just build a uh, bipedal robot that just walks around is really robust, then I think that lends itself to a certain set of simplifications. Whereas for us, parkour, uh, it was interesting in that it basically led to having to have more complexity in the model than you might need for something like human noise blocking. Um, and uh, so it's really, I think, defined by what the problem space that you're working in is. And for us, you know, I, I think we all know that the simplifications that we're making are uh, more than we should technically, if we had the ability to capture all of the relevant dynamical effects of the robot uh, in our models and use those, then we certainly would. But for practical reasons, you just can't do that. So we've, we've been trying to ride the line between representation of the important effects uh, that matter for the robot and, and, and trying to balance that against, um, you know, computational feasibility, basically. Thank you, Scott. So uh, Dong Yun, you had some questions from the audience. Unmute. Uh, Dong Hin, you have to un unmute. Thank you. And uh, I have a question about that uh, control hierarchy. So first, you specify the foot uh, placement and timing. I believe uh, at, after that point, MPC does not change the step sequence or timing, and then you project it to the full uh, body dynamics. Uh, how much information is used in the full sequence uh, foot step uh, planning and timing? And is that MPC doesn't change any full location or timing? Yeah, uh, great question. So um, I think that there's a spectrum of answers there. And uh, there, there's a huge, I think one of the important open problems for us to work on in the future is making a more sophisticated connection between the sort of discrete decision, decision making layer of the system, which, you know, in this case could be footstep location planning, uh, and the underlying continuous dynamical motions that we're actually executing. Uh, so for now, we've been mostly using pretty simple geometric heuristics. There's no timing information embedded in these sort of high level goal locations of where the uh, where we want the robot to contact the environment. The timing information comes from the, the sort of uh, dynamic trajectories that are present in the library. And again, um, because we're using predictive control online, the, the, it's able to both adjust the location of where it actually hits the ground. Uh, it'll be biased towards trying to get to where we want it to go, but it doesn't have to. Um, and it's, it's free to adjust the, the timing and, and as well the, the forces that it applies whenever it's touching something. I have actually one more question. So MPC solved the solution with the centroid uh, dynamics and then you project it to the whole body dynamics. Uh, central mass trajectory is kind of easy because it's a really the sum of the, each link, but centroid angular position is something Hard to define how you project that angular position to the full body. 
Yeah, so we have some some answers to that that I, I probably don't want to share totally in public. Um, okay. But you know, there's there's some answers that you can look at in the literature. So like a keyword to look up there would be angular excursion. And so if you have a trajectory for uh, inertia and angular momentum over time, then you can and some starting angular configuration, then you can numerically integrate that around along a path to get some angular configuration into the future. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Krishnan, you had some questions from the audience. Hi, yeah, so um, I think uh, there are a few questions about what kinds of applications are enabled by humanoids, like specifically like um, maybe bipedal robots or I guess more generally, like what are the benefits of adopting sort of anthropomorphic robot designs um, for certain applications? Like, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, I mean, for us, Atlas is, you know, we're not we're not trying to have like a go to market strategy for Atlas. So, you know, for us as, as an R&D project that's just meant to uh, really just push forward the science of robotics as, as much as we can, humanoids are a great platform because, you know, it's a very capable form factor. You know, human beings are able to do lots of interesting things. Um, and it has the sort of uh, interesting challenges associated with scale and complexity and all of these things. Um, if you were to think about why you might build a biped product, uh, yeah, there are, there are some probably some form factor considerations. You know, we can be dynamically balanced. We can go over uh, really challenging terrain that would be limiting for wheeled systems. We're kind of tall and thin, uh, which is uh, maybe more useful than having a quadruped or uh, some other you know bigger multi-legged robot. Um, so I think there are, there are some arguments you can make for why a humanoid or bipedal form factor would make sense. Uh, in a practical way. I think if you're, uh, you know, picking any one specific set of problems uh, that you want to solve and maybe build a product around, um, the chances that the optimal design that you might come up with is a humanoid is maybe slim. But in terms of sort of versatility, excitement, um, and its ability to present challenging problems for us to do research on, I think it's a pretty cool, uh, a pretty cool form factor. Thank you. And Scott. if I could add a follow up. Oh, sorry. Sure. Um, sure. Go ahead, Krishna. Yeah. Um, are there any, like, I don't know, things that you've learned from working with Atlas that have made it into some of the other robot products as well that um, Boston Dynamics is working on? Yeah, good question. So uh, I think all the stuff that I've described here, um, you shouldn't interpret as being representative of the choices that are being made in other projects. Um, with that being said, our goal is to be a sort of R&D unit within a larger company. And so uh, we're trying to develop, you know, in addition to pursuing our own specific project goals and, and, and leading to specific experimental results on Atlas, in the process of doing that, we're trying to build general tools, which can be in the form of software libraries and, and things like that, that uh, have started to make their way across the company. So I would basically, I would say what I, the details of what I'm saying in these slides uh, shouldn't be interpreted as, as being related to necessarily what any of the other robots are doing. Um, but a lot of the technology that enables and underlies uh, these sort of ideas that I've talked about uh, are sort of general purpose things that we're, we're taking advantage of. Thank you, Scott. So Nima, you have a question from the audience. Yeah, thank you for the great talk. So we had a great question from Rob Howe. He asked, what do you think of mechanical compliance and is it good or bad for control? And following up on that, do you wish you had more or less of it? Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm happy with no mechanical compliance in Atlas, <laughs> or at least no intentional mechanical compliance. Um, I, think it's, I think it can be really good if you are able to, at design time, decide what the right compliance is for your robot. Uh, so um, I, I think in so far as you can do that, then it can be really beneficial because then you're just basically building, you know, part of what would have to be the control solution into the mechanism itself. Um, but for a robot that's meant to do many different things, it's sort of hard to figure out exactly what those, you know, compliances should be. And so in so far as we're able to kind of uh, just implement that at, at the joint control level, um, I think that that's sort of a, a more flexible solution. Thanks, Scott. Uh, Neil, you had a, one question from the audience. Yeah, um, there have been a bunch of questions about design and 
So I was just going to ask, um, in the beginning, you said one of your objectives was to push the, the frontiers of what Alice can do on the design side. And so is there a principled way to different sort of differentiate between uh, control limitations of your behaviors or hardware limitations? And so like sort of how do you go back and close the loop with the people that designed the robot? Yeah, it's a good question. I think there's not always a crystal clear answer to that, right? So, you know, you can uh, imagine using our kind of tools to develop a, a behavior that would be sort of aspirational for what the current robot can do. And, um, you know, there may be ways to do that behavior that would be slightly different. It would still qualify as say, I don't know, a double backflip or something like that. There may be details on how you can control a double backflip that could be in or outside of the envelope of any given hardware system. So I think it's mostly just us uh, looking carefully at things and, and trying to decide, yeah, this is a sort of a real limitation that uh, seems to come up across multiple behaviors so that if we can only make this part of the robot better, uh, this would really enable us to push further. So it's more of a less of a precise thing that we can point at and more of an iterative dis, you know, discussion between different uh, uh, types of engineers and, and then we come to a consensus, consensus about what the path forward should be. Thank you. Uh, Sangbe, you had more questions on your repertoire of one hour discussion. Yeah, I'll, I'll read one of the audience question. Uh, Steven uh, Jorgensen, uh, is, he said, in your opinion, how important is the exact programming precision of the torque or force control in low level? Oh, um, yeah, I mean, having very good uh, joint level control is, is uh, really important. Uh, if you're doing a bad job at, you know, whatever style of control you're doing, if you're doing force control or position control, if you're doing a bad job at the joint level, that just makes everything harder. Uh, so yeah, don't, you know, if there's, there's still um, uh, wins to be had at, at tuning low level control, uh, spend a week doing it. Yeah, but would you say like 95% is good enough or you have to achieve 100% or 98% no, no, is no, enough? No, I don't think you, I, I don't know how to put numbers to it in, in a way that's okay. meaningful, but <laughs> I think, uh, you know, I, I don't think you need to go crazy with all kinds of really isolated tests and doing chirps and sign, you know, step functions and all this stuff and, and making sure that your joint level tracking is perfect. I think uh, if you're running experiments on behaviors you care about and you can see that there are certain joints that are just doing a bad job, you should fix that. Um, I great. have a, one more following question with it. Uh, how about the intuition between the torque versus position? Which one is more important? Uh, I don't have a general answer to that. Uh, yeah. both. <laughs> okay. Michael, you have a question. Scott, great talk and uh, fascinating talk. Yes. I just had a question. So if you were to update uh, your humanoid robot, uh, what would be your first uh, desire? Oh gosh. Um, well, I want you to make it 10% lighter and 50% stronger. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> and also I have a, a question more related to the um, MPC controller that you have. Um, do you ever run into situations where the optimization takes too long or maybe you have back of convergence? Yeah, so um, it's certainly, there's no guarantee that you won't be just accidentally creating an infeasible problem or something like that. Usually that happens when things have gone really wrong on the robot and um, you know, you're, you're probably gonna have to like bail or switch to a different controller or something like that. Uh, I think, you know, in general, when the robot's kind of doing what we want it to do, uh, infeasibilities and variance and solve time are not really an issue. And um, part of that is because of the way we've architected things where we're leveraging lots of high quality offline solutions in order to make MPC's job uh, a lot easier. Um, so I think if we were instead doing something where, you know, we were having really complicated generative MPC controllers that uh, were figuring everything out online, um, I think you would, you know, in, they, they might be more robust, but I think in, in many cases, they'd be numerically a lot more brittle. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Um, I actually wanted to ask a perception and vision question. So I saw that uh, for now you've been working a lot with like flat surfaces, mm -hmm. mainly, uh, like slanted in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, but um, can you maybe talk about uh, what are kind of the biggest challenges there of 
closing these control loops and MPC loops around perception and maybe how can you get into more unstructured environments and how are you yeah. thinking about so, that? Yeah, I think, you know, we're definitely interested as a project of, of you know, broadening the scope of where and what Atlas is doing. Um, uh, and that involves, you know, going outside and being able to do responsive dynamic behavior in unstructured environments as well. Uh, you know, I think we've just been, you know, we're a small team. We've basically just been biting off pieces to the puzzle in order to sort of march towards this bigger goal of, you know, do, you know, being able to do this kind of behavior for real. And we've kind of been picking our problems. And one of the things that we've been okay with is, uh, you know, leveraging more structured environments in order to make progress uh, on the control side. Um, but I think, you know, going forward, there are lots of uh, ideas about how to make things better. So, you know, doing more uh, sort of slam-like things so that, you can uh, better keep track of environments when things are going in and out of the field of view when you're doing crazy spin jumps, things like that, uh, as well as, yeah, getting away from uh, assumptions about simple geometries in the robot's environment so that it can, you know, um, go outside and uh, do cool tricks off of natural features. Okay, thank you. Um, Adato, you had a question. Um, yeah, um, I, I wanted to ask Scott, uh, so you, um, so you sort of show these approach where you have uh, an episodic nature of trajectories where you combine <clears throat> uh, sort of behaviors from a library and then an uh, online an MPC controller that sort of deals with the uh, smoothing and the robustness. Um, and I wanted sort of like a long-term vision, not Boston Dynamics perspective, but your perspective. Um, if you think that that is the end or that is a step towards something that we haven't figured out yet. Like for example, just to finish the question, mm -hmm. if I look at the visionary um, animation that you started with, uh, Atlas sort of jumping sideways and using the hand, I'm not sure that I can see that as an episodic behavior uh, or if that had to also be inside the library. Yeah, so, all right, so the, the, the last point about could that behavior be represented in what we're doing now, I think, Yes, um, you know, and it's one of the things we're, we're looking at is, is um, behaviors that are sort of akin to that is, is, is something that's certainly on our radar. And so we have, we have ways that we think that that makes sense in the framework that I talked about. Uh, in, in terms of like the grand vision for like, what is the right solution here? You know, we could start with what would be nice if it were possible. And that would be, you know, being able to do all of this optimization online. You know, I'd love for that to be the answer where you just get rid of all this library stuff, all this offline stuff and uh, just do everything online. That's just hard. And it's not hard just because, you know, we need better computer chips. It's hard because these are really hard non-convex problems. And so getting to the point where you can not only solve them fast enough, but have them be solved with enough reliability is just a really tall order. So I think you have to leverage some kind of pre-computation in order to make that optimization feasible. In our case, we've chosen to use trajectories because it's a nice way to sort of summarize prior information about what is a good, you know, spin jump. Uh, but there's lots of other options you could consider too, right? You can imagine uh, learning cost structures like value functions or something like that in order to make MPC smarter. Um, so I think that, you know, there's many different possible technical answers, but the gist of doing online optimization and then leveraging something that you've pre-computed in order to make that more effective is a solution that I would believe in as a sort of long-term thing. Um, the other thing that we're not really doing here is sort of improving from experience, right? So the robot could do, uh, you know, 10 backflips in the lab and it's never gonna get better at doing backflips. It's never gonna learn anything from the data uh, that it's generating in those backflips unless we look at it and make some changes. So that seems like an opportunity that we could uh, pursue in the future where you know, robots could sort of slowly get better over time instead of, you know, what usually happens is they slowly get worse over time because hardware drifts and things like that. Thank you. Uh, so we have more uh, audience question. Neil, you had one. Yeah, uh, this question from Quilpa, I think. I'm sorry if I pronouncing that wrong. But uh, what kind of contact models are you using for the robots? And I guess I'll add on to that. How does that influence the design of your optimization and the controller? Uh, yeah, so, you know, I think for the, the there's a, a bunch of different notions of contact that are throughout the system um, that I won't get into the details of, but, you know, broadly speaking, a lot of what we're doing is just thinking about points of contact on the robot's uh, geometries, like its feet and things like that. So I think, you know, in terms of 
uh, you know, lots of special insights around like context modeling and simulation and stuff like that. We just, there's nothing, um, there's, there's no magic sauce there, I think. Thanks. Nima, you had one question from the audience. Yes, uh, this is a question from Anonymous. Um, they ask, when is Atlas getting a hand with fingers? Say it again. Getting a hand with fingers? Yes. Uh, it has, there are hands. I've seen them on the shelves and in, in the lab. Um, but I mean, it, it's, it's really a function of what we're doing with the robot, right? So uh, one of the things that Atlas was used for in the past was uh, sort of moving boxes around. And in that case, it made sense to have hands on the robot. Uh, for us right now, we would just smash the hands to bits, you know, on a weekly basis. It doesn't really make sense to put hands on the robot. So I think as we're, um, you know, continuing to broaden the scope of what we want Atlas to do and what we try to do with the robot, then things like, you know, dexterous hands may become on the table. But for us, since we're mostly focused on sort of whole body athletic things, uh, having dexterous hands doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Great, thank you. Um, Krishnan had a few questions um, from the audience. Yeah, so there were kind of a couple of questions about um, planning with the unexpected or real world surprises that may happen when you're executing a trajectory that you calculated offline. So one of them is, do you have any insights on how you can formalize the reality hits outcome between planning a trajectory that works offline but will likely fail on hardware? And then a follow-up would be, when the robot fails to recover, um, do you think that if your actuators had more power, MPC, MPC would be able to stabilize them? They're both from anonymous. Okay, um, I'll have you repeat the second question after I finish the answering the first one. Uh, so the, the first is, I guess, a question about how to um, prevent as much as possible false positives in our offline slash simulation development step. Um, you know, I think it's, it's a hard thing to do in general, right? So by and large, we use simulation very effectively in our workflow, uh, not only for sort of unit testing things and making sure that our code's not breaking over time, but um, as part of our evaluation of new behaviors. And um, it's important to, to do things like have this, the same, uh, you know, control and estimation code running on the robot as you have in simulation. Uh, we also have some really approximate notions of the actuator model that exists in the simulator that wouldn't exist in the models that we're using for optimization. So, you know, op uh, simulation for us is a pretty good net that catches bad things before we put them on the robot. Uh, but occasionally something that looks good in simulation doesn't quite work on the robot. And uh, I think the best answer we have so far is that we've learned uh, a lot of the ways in which the hardware would fail where the simulation might not. And then we try to look at the simulation results and try to analyze those signals in order to get a feeling for whether we think this is really going to work on the robot or not. But you know, having you know more automation there, for example, that we could uh, use to kind of classify the results of simulations, I think would be really cool. But it's a hard problem in general. And sure, uh, I can repeat the second question if you like. Um, they were asking um, when a robot sort of fails to recover. Um, I guess. Mm -hmm and falls over, um, do you think that in those kind of instances, if the actuators had more power behind them, the MPC would be able to stabilize um, in those cases? It depends on the details of what happened. Um, so if you know, the robot's you know, careening sideways through the air, there's not much that actuator strength is going to do for you. Uh, but maybe in some cases where you, know, you just ran out of knee torque, and if you could push a little bit harder, you would have actually cleared the box that you crashed into, uh, then sure, it could help in that case. Uh, in terms of like failures, um, you know, we don't do a, a ton right now to uh, prevent them. Well, we try to prevent them, but we don't do a ton to uh, try to actively recover. We have a couple things where you know, we're using some existing control strategies for doing footstep placement to recover balance, as well as uh, just a sort of you know safe fall behavior, which was a, a common strategy as well in the DRC. So a lot of the that famous DRC fail reel has the robot in some kind of soft, squishy position control thing where it falls over and looks kind of like a soft statue. Thank you. Well, thanks. thanks. So Neil, you have uh, one last audience question. Hey, Seth. I got like another compound audience question. Uh, it's um, 
what type of trajectory optimization do you use on Atlas? Uh, direct uh, shooting or some type of differential dynamic programming? And maybe some people ask more generally what your preference for trajectory optimization is. And I'm guessing this problem specific, but if you could just kind of expand on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have uh, I don't have a strong bias. Um, I think the you know the the sparsity pattern stuff I showed on the slide should lend itself to uh, indicating that we're using a direct method. Um, but you know, I think I, I don't I don't suspect that there it would be impossible to produce similar results with either class of algorithms. Like I said, there's ways to efficiently solve problems that uh, take advantage of you know uh, small problem sizes and the sequential nature of these problems. Uh, and, and also ways that you can write it as a big, sparse, just nonlinear program. We tend to do the latter, but uh, I think you could easily have success doing it the other way too. Great, thank you. Um, can, I, can I ask one last question? Sure. So uh, Scott, like, you know, uh, there are a lot of students are watching this and a lot of students are dreaming to general controller. Do you have any advice like, you know, as I said, students could be biased because of our structures and schools and you know schools and you know what's going on in the, compress, you know, the, the company. And would you just give a one advice? Uh, advice to, you know, how to uh, do this for a job? Is that, the, is that the question? Well, you know, they want to be a great robot control designer in the future. And if you if you are, your one word guidance can change their you know uh, oh yeah okay career so got it so uh, all right so a couple things one I'm going to reiterate what I said before uh, there's no experience for just doing it so as much as possible get your hands on robots uh, join research labs take project courses uh, and get the experience that you need to to really understand the ins and outs of getting things to really work on robots the other thing I would say is be very open minded with um, your uh, approaches to control. I think, you know, it's easy uh, when you're a student to, you know, get really excited about a very narrow set of ideas and then look for all the places that you could apply that set of ideas in order to solve problems. Uh, I would encourage you to think about it the other way where you just try to find the most exciting problems and evenly evaluate all the possible algorithmic approaches that would be a good sort of engineering solution to those problems. Uh, and then learn as much, as much as you can about the ones that look the most promising and, and try them out. Thank you so much. It's wonderful. Oh, it's a time to wrap up. I would like to thank again, Scott, for the insightful talk and the tips for the students. I'm sure that uh, they will be very useful. And I uh, absolutely uh, share them. So I have good news for the people that are uh, listening today. Robotics Today is going to continue in July. We're going to have uh, two additional talks, one on July 10th and the other one on July 24th. The one on July 10th will be given by Nara Ovikiaman at the UIUC, and the one on July 24th will be given by Sid Srinivasa. So stay tuned for the details, and we look forward to seeing you next time. <laughs>